we'll start today's discussion uh, with the electronic ignition system see uh, the ignition system is of two types one is the distributor ignition system and one is the electronic ignition system so and in bikes also we have similar kind of uh, ignition system but they are capacitor based okay so what is distributor ignition system this is something which is mechanically controlled right when the cylinder when the engine is multi cylinder then you have more than one uh, cylinders to to uh, fire up right so in one cylinder it is very easy to fire uh, the spark to to create the spark it is easy and that can be done by just simple cam and uh, your uh, cam cam shaft and the timing system but when uh, this multi cylinder ro role comes in like three cylinder four cylinder or maybe five or six cylinder engines they come so when exactly should you fire this spark and how exactly that can be controlled so we know that if anything mechanically is controlled that will be having a lot of losses that will be having a uh, lesser efficiency or accuracy as compared to when the things are electronically controlled so by making use of some sensors machine languages and some instructions algorithms and some circuits we replace the mechanical hardware part with the elect electrical uh, electronic software part and some chips and some sensors some microcontrollers so this would be the major difference i'll just brief you about what uh, ignition system is there is a spark plug over here and this spark plug has to create a spark inside the combustion chamber this spark is supposed to have some timing so suppose this is the piston at this point of time right and this piston is moving upward upward like here so this piston when it reaches the bd btc uh, the sorry the tdc and when the pressure is when the compression is at maximum then this spark plug has to create a spark when the compression is maximum so that thing is already studied researched and decided like okay this will be the timing uh, setup and at this particular time this will be uh, generating a spark so that the piston uh, the the com compressed air fuel mixture it is ignited and piston is pushed downward and then the cycle can continue but in we know that there are two procedures mechanical and uh, the electrical pro electronic procedure to control this spark but how exactly that is done so that is done first of all we'll understand what electronic ignition system is let us first understand what is the requirement of ignition system in an elect in an internal combustion engine the combustion is continuous cycle and occurs thousands of times in a minute thousands of time in a minute you can you imagine so an an effective and accurate source of ignition is required you can just imagine in in the blink of the eye there will be thousands of cycles that are running inside the engine and if even if one cycle disturbs that means the whole uh, system is going to be disturbed so this ignition system should, should be perfect as per the designs it should not have any issues otherwise there will be some consequences that the engine will face and the consequences will be discussed in the upcoming slides the electronic ignition system is the type of ignition system that uses electric electronic circuit usually transistors controlled by the sensors to generate electric pulses in which which in turn generate the better spark and can even burn the lean mixture to provide better economy and lower emissions 
emissions means uh, the gases that are pa passing through the exhaust so they have lower uh, emission uh, stand i mean emissions so the gases and unburned uh, carbon particle unburned fuel particles they, they are less in that so sensors and electronic component give more effective and accurate output than mechanical components so the use of sensors and electronic control unit becomes essential to fulfill the needs of modern high power and high speed automobiles and in order to meet the performance high mileage and greater reliability so we'll just understand what components are there in an electronic uh, ignition system so first of all there is a brain brain which has the algorithm set and the commands preset in it that this 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 particular spark plug is going to be ignited at that time it going to be connected with the ignition coil at that time and then there is uh, a distributor also and then there is a, a, a ignition coil so basically we have 12 volt battery in our vehicle and the 12 volt battery is powering this complete setup so the 12 volt battery see these 12 volt batteries are inside this uh, ignition coil they are so much enhanced that it can produce this spark of this intensity and for the repeated times so this is positive terminal negative terminal then this is the ignition switch then this is the uh, ecm or electronic control module from here the instructions are coming then there is a ignition coil and then the distributor and from directly from the distributor there are some spark plugs and when there is no distributor there is some uh, controller over here that controls the timing of the uh, spark plug so basically this is something that controls the timing ignition time timing distributor so if there is no distributor there will be some controller that that controls the time of the spark then there are some vacuum advance and some armature or reluctor or magnetic pickup. So these are some things that that uh, are the part of the ignition system. What happens when you switch on the ignition switch? So basically you are completing the circuit. So this negative is ground on the vehicle and this positive this goes to the ECM and then to the ignition coil and then to the distributor and uh, from distributor the, through the cables the spark plugs are attached so when you switch on the ignition switch uh, the circuit gets complete and this uh, ignition coil it it is uh, now uh, multiplying the 12 volts and it is producing way higher volt uh, voltages that this 12 volt battery is having so these high current high voltage current is going to the distributor and from the distributor the circuit gets complete so remember the next thing that we will be discussing will be the timing ignition timing so this is the electronic ignition system then there is distributor components as i said uh, the battery ignition switch ignition control module and armature the ignition coil and spark plug so battery is the powerhouse that powers up the ignition system uh, ignition switch is just a switch that completes the circuit and that puts the system to on or off then ignition control module or control unit of the ignition system it is the brain of the uh, brain or the programmed instructions given to the ignition system which monitors and controls the timing and intensity of the sparks automatically it is the device that receives voltages voltage signal from the armature and sets the primary coil on or off it can be placed separately outside the distributor or can be placed inside electronic con uh, control unit box of the vehicle then you have the armature the armature consists of the reluctor with the teeth rotating part uh, the vacuum advance and uh, pickup coil and an electronic module receives the voltage signal from the armature in order to make or break the circuit which in turn sets the timing or the distributor to the accurately distribute the current to the spark plugs then you have the ignition coil the ignition coil is used uh, in the electronic ignition system to produce high voltage to the spark plug so basically it converts your 12 volt uh, battery to the high voltage system the spark plug is used to generate the spark inside the cylinder then there is a small video uh, for this electronic control module. See, this is battery ignition coil, and this is uh, the just I'll play the video. Spark plugs, 
distributor it is then this is your ignition coil and this is the ignition control module battery and armature so armature sends signal to the ignition module to make and break the circuit or to complete the circuit basically so if we just roll back the video you will see see now this distributor this is the point if i pause the video over here as soon as this point this rotating part of the distributor it reaches the contact point of the spark plug see this is spark plug number 1 and this is the rotating part in the distributor so there are four spark plugs and four points uh, contact points of the each spark plug so this leads to the spark plug 1 and this one leads to spark plug 3 and this to 2 and this to 4 so as soon as this will reach in any of these points contact so this signal this system will be activated the circuit will be completed just try to see this video see now when you switched on the key so the current started flowing from battery to the electronic control module and from the electronic control module to the ignition coil and then the armature is producing a signal that tells when to stop the current or when to flow the current so the electronic control module uh, sense, senses the signal produced by the pickup coil and stops the current flow from the primary circuit so this is how it happens so a timing circuit inside the ignition control module turns on or uh, the off switch now due to the continuous make and break of the current a magnetic field is created and that just transforms uh, the 12 volt into as much as 50000 volts and this current this voltage and current high high voltage current is going to the distributor now and you see that the distributor as soon as it touch any of the contact point a current circuit is completed for that particular spark plug and at the same time the spark is generated inside that particular spark plug and this is the result of a multi cylinder engine so this is why a distributor is used now when we discuss the completely electronic uh, control um sorry guys it's a small technical glitch we will sort it soon
Subin, I don't know what is happening. I'm getting disconnected, though my internet is working very fine here. The, there is no fluctuation in the internet. Could you look into this? Uh, so I can't see any problem from this side. Not quite sure what's the problem. Do you know how for how long I was disconnected? Uh, maybe two or three minutes. I think when you play the video, last time also it got stuck when you played the video, right? I don't know what is happening. Okay. So this, uh, did I start this video? I mean, uh, before I, I, I lost the con uh, connection, was this video playing? No, I guess. Okay. So this is the distributed ignition system. The electronic ignition system was over. This is the distributor ignition system. And this in, inside the distributor, there is a rotating part that comes in contact with the rotatory part or the stationary part of the spark plugs, the contact points basically. So it, it's like there are different contact points like this, and there is one rotary part. So As soon as this rotary part comes in any of these contact points, that particular spark plug is activated to ignite. And if this is this comes in contact with this, then this one will be activated. Then this one will be activated. So it is not a perfect perfect contact or perfect touch. It is. It is just like a, a minute gap inside these two contact points, so that there is no wear and tear. So this is very smartly designed, but though it is a mechanical thing, over the time there will be some uh, components that will be wearing out. So the timing will be disturbed. And this is why we will need the complete electronic uh, ignition system, which has the controller, uh, pre-designed controller that re re replaces the distributor and that uh, works as the connection established uh, device or connection basically uh, on or off device for this particular spark timing. Then this was the distributor video that I wanted to show you. There are some parts. So this is a 12 volt DC battery and this will be connected to the, uh, the negative terminal to the ground and positive turning terminal to the ignition coil, then to the circuit breaker. And then from the circuit breaker, uh, the current will be passed on to the uh, spark plugs through the contact points distributor, basically. So these are separate uh, spark plugs and these are the contact points of the distributor. And this is the rotatory part of the distributor. And whenever the circuit gets completed, you will see that this spark is uh, generated inside that particular spark plug. So it depends on the uh, voltage system of the uh, vehicle, like how much voltage this particular ignition coil has to produce. So inside a bike, it is less inside cars. It is more and inside other vehicles. So it is variable. So this is this might be a good reason that you cannot use any ignition coil in any vehicle like there is always a rating, there is always a design for everything. So though the principle and the working will be same, but the, there will be requirements of several voltages. So it would be varying from 22,000 to maybe 50,000 and as and when required. So this is the ignition system. Now, what is the ignition timing? The, the, the next question is the ignition timing. So first of all, we will understand what is the ignition timing? The ignition timing refers to the angular position of the crankshaft relative to the top dead center. That is the crankshaft angular position at which the piston is exact at the top of the compression stroke. In simple words, the ignition timing should be done perfectly at when the compression stroke is at maximum at the top level. Okay, so when the compression is at the top level, then there should be the spark. 
and that should be the ignition timing for every cylinder so if it is single cylinder engine only one cylinder is uh, uh, firing up and if it is multi cylinder there are multiple cylinders which cannot be fired at the same time so there should be a variable time for every cylinder it should not be that all the cylinders are firing up at the same time that won't do any good so it is like when the crankshaft is rotating different cylinders are firing up at different times so that the crankshaft is having power stroke at every moment at every possible moment so the ignition timing is an important variable in obtaining the best performance from an engine and it is optimally set for the efficiency to what is called mbt or maximum brake torque different cylinder head and piston designs change how fast the flame travels so the spark needs to fire at different times to create the maximum pressure at the right time and the solution to that is the advance or retard timing so this is a separate part that needs to be discussed like if there is a there, there there is any ignition advance or ignition retard what does it mean so before that i'll tell you why in multiple cylinder in, in engines uh there is a requirement of spark at different times so let's say there are four cylinders one two three and four and each of these are connected to the crankshaft okay so let's say this is the crankshaft and these are connected so see if the spark happens at the same time in all the four cylinders so during that time this crankshaft will be having a lot of power right but at the when the spark is done for the rest of the time it is not having any power so it is better like we when we ignite this we do not ignite these three so it is a it is an order like first this one will be ignited then this one will be ignited then this one will be ignited then this one will be ignited so this will be like every time the crankshaft is having certain power there is no loss of power there is no disturbance of uh, power there are minimum vibrations so there is the ignition time also and ignition order also like the timing is exactly when should the ignition be done in any particular cylinder and ignition order is like which engine which cylinder should be fired first and then which cylinder and then which then which the order basically like 1 4 3 2 uh, or 1 2 3 4 which one should be fired so i have a smart video in order to uh, know how and why this ignition order or spark timing is essentially required so timing is again i'm telling the timing is when exactly should the uh, spark be generated inside a particular cylinder timing and order these are two different things do not uh, just similarize them so these are two different thing this is like when should the spark be fired inside any particular uh cylinder and the order is when you have a multiple uh, cylinders inside the engine what should be the order of firing in each cylinder like 1 4 3 2 like first one this will be uh, fired up then this will be fired up then this will be fired up or then this will be fired up right so these things we need to focus and now we'll go with the advance ignition advance and ignition retard so different cylinder head position design changes uh, change fa how fast the flame travels so spark needs to be fired at different times to create maximum pressure at the right time so this so this solution is to advance or retard the timing so what is ignition advance the ad advancing the time means the plug fires earlier in the compression stroke i mean when the compression is not at the maximum it fires a little bit earlier than that so this is known as the ignition advance so basically it is happening ignition is happening in advance then uh, we have the ignition retard 
that means the ignition will be happening later after the compression was maximum so retarding the timing means the plug fires later in the compression stroke so in in the first ca case it is the farther from tdc and in and in, in the second case it is closer to the tdc top dead center we are talking about in firing order of an internal combustion engine is the sequence of ignition of the cylinders and in a diesel engine the firing order corresponds to the order in which the fuel is injected inside each cylinder so understand in the ci engine it is the injection timing firing timing is basically related to the injection timing and in si engine it is the firing order i mean firing timing of the spark plug so firing order affects the vibration sound and evenness of power output from the engine the firing order ha heavily influences the crankshaft design so we will see what is firing order and then we will see what is uh, knocking what is pre ignition and what is detonation okay so before that now i would like to you to tell me if you have any answers i'll pause my uh, screen for a moment and do you have any questions so far the discussion we just had okay no distributor part okay i'll explain this just a moment so the distributor is like it is a box and that box is carrying a current from the ignition coil you have the ignition coil that converts your 12 volt from the battery and it gives this 12 volt converted into 20000 to 50000 voltages to the distributor at this point right and this point is having a rotatory part and there are four contact points or you can say carbons four carbons don't say them contact points say them these two these four are some conductive materials anything you can say carbons or bushes whatever you want to say you can say and this is the rotatory part so at this particular time it is in contact with this so this high voltage current that is flowing through this cable is directly connected on to this part and this part is attached with the rotatory point over here then let's say this is spark plug number 1 okay then in next time this is spark plug number 1 so this is uh, going to spark this particular when this is in contact with this point then there will be the next contact this contact will now be lost when this is rotating this now is lost and then there is new contact then let's say this is the uh, spark plug number 3 and then this will be the next contact let's say this is spark plug number 4 and then there will be one more contact let's say this is spark plug number 2 so what happens is this is the rotary part this part is your rotary part it keeps on rotating and as it rotates it comes in contact with these contact points which is which are directly connected through the cable to the spark plugs so when this there is one this is one wire basically and th this is connected over here so what will happen when you basically complete the circuit this circuit so this month this means spark plug number 1 is highlighted and when this circuit breaks from here this will be connected to here that means spark plug number 3 will be highlighted or 3 will be established the in the connection then similarly 4 and similarly 1 so this is the role of a distributor now if we have to replace the distributor we should have some electronic uh, device that that can be named as the controller and the controller is a pre programmed thing basically it is a mini computer you can see 
which is already programmed like this is happening mechanically now this is a there is a circuit that is already established like at this particular time the this particular spark plug will be in action at this particular time this one will be in action at this time this one will be in action this will be be in action in the next time so this is the order of uh, i mean uh, ignition system the spark plug. Okay, so ignition timing. Uh, I'll now show you a video of the ignition timing. This is ignition timing or fire firing order basically. So this video has uh, audio. So I'll play this audio to for you. So that in an ignition system, explain fire. We know that in an ignition system. The distributor passes the spark to each of the spark plug leads one at a time. So we can say this is what I was telling you about the distributor. Say that in one revolution, the number of sparks produced by distributor is equal to the number of cylinders in the engine. Now let's consider a four cylinder engine. We know that the cylinders get sparked one by one. And each cylinder requires a spark. In every 720 degrees of crankshaft revolution. So we can say that a spark takes place in every 180 degrees of crankshaft revolution. The order in which the cylinders are sparked is called firing order. Thus we can define firing order as the order of sparking in the cylinders of a multi-cylinder engine. Firing order of an engine. Depends on the number of cylinders in the engine. The power strokes also need to be equally placed to get an equally balanced movement of the crankshaft. The three main factors affecting the firing order are engine vibrations, engine cooling, and development of back pressure. Now, let's try to find out the firing order of the four cylinder engine we had considered. Let's consider that the first cylinder is fired. Now the force F acting downwards on this cylinder gives rise to forces in bearings A and B of magnitude F into B by A plus B and F into A by A plus B respectively. Clearly, force in bearing A is greater than the force in bearing B. So, if we fire the second cylinder next, the load on bearing A will increase, which may cause engine vibrations. To reduce this and even out the load, we need to fire the third cylinder now. Also, if we fire cylinders 1 and 2 in succession, half part of the engine will get very heated, which will imbalance the load on cooling systems. To decrease this load, we need to fire the cylinder 3 after cylinder 1. Moreover, firing the first and second cylinders in succession may also result into high pressure in the exhaust pipe, which could in initiate the backflow of exhaust gases. However, if we fire the third cylinder after the first cylinder, The exhaust gases and would not create pressure in the exhaust pipe. Possible firing orders for a four cylinder engine can be 1, 3, 4, 2, or firing order 1, 3, 4, 2 is used more commonly. Similarly, for a six cylinder engine, the possible firing orders can be. 1536241546231246523 and 1236543 but the firing order 153624 is most commonly used 
The related terms are Okay, so let me just summarize three points for you. In order to have a firing order uh, in perfection or in precision and as per the requirements, we need to focus on three points, only on three points. First of all, the engine vibrations. Then secondly, the engine cooling. And then third, the development of the back pressure. So engine vibrations should be minimum possible as all the parts are moving and rotary parts. So there, there is uh, like uh, natural tendency of the vibrations, but we should keep them as minimum as possible. So vibrations will be minimum when there is a proper balancing of piston movement. When there is a proper balancing, the proper balancing can only be achieved when there is the spark generated in, in, uh, in a uh, in a designed fashion, in an organized fashion, right? And then the engine cooling also. So the spark is basically an explosion. An explosion will basically lead into uh, the heat generation. And the heat should be gen uh, generated, although it is natural, the heat will be generated, but it, it should be eliminated or it should be flushed away as early as possible and in a designed fashion. Like it should not be complete cold. There is a limitation for heat removal also, like up to 30% of the heat should be removed, not entirely, because at, at lower temperatures, the thermal the engine should not be older than that. And then the development of back pressure. Back pressure is basically uh, coming back of the exhaust emission gases back into the cylinder like the exhaust that was going outside that is coming back into the cylinder and that puts some pressure so that has a lot of reasons because of which back pressure can be developed but spark wrong timing is also one of them because of, of which back pressure will be developed now let's say everything is in perfection and everything is uh, good and fine but what if this is not perfect? What is this is not good? If it, if it is not good, then there will be three problems, knocking, pre-ignition and detonation. So basically, when knock, detonation or pre-ignition occur, the air fuel mixture is ignited at an improper time in the cycle. Like it is either happening earlier, it is happening uh, in later stage, but it is not happening on the proper time. It is improper. So detonation is uncontrolled combustion event where, and which occurs after the spark event. And the pre-ignition is uncontrolled combustion which occurs before the spark event. Like there is a decided time. There is a designed time that only when the spark should happen. So if detonation is occurring, that is occurring because the spark was happened at a later stage at, from which it is intended to have and pre-ignition as the name suggests it is happening before the spark event now knock is actual noise that can be heard uh, by the audience or by the bystanders if detonation is bad enough so knocking is that sound i'll i'll, I'll uh, share a video of knocking sound also then you probably you can hear it is it is very unusual, like if you hear the sound of a perfectly healthy engine, it will be very smooth. But when there is knocking or when there is detonation, you will hear some disturbances from the engines coming. Some uh, some sort of disturbances that you could uh, easily identify that this is knocking. Then severe detonation over an extended time can damage the pistons, rods, rod bearings and other engine components if you can audibly hear the knock, then it's time to verify your tune and the fuel. Which brings us to the next point, octane number. So what is the octane number of any uh, fuel that you are using? So the octane number basically, a fuel's ability to resist the knocking, pre-ignition and detonation. A fuel octane rating is measured is a measure of fuel's ability to resist the detonation. 
the higher the octane number the more resistance it has to the detonation after this we will have the cooling system but i have a research video that was recorded one when uh, these ignition timings and detonation pre ignition and uh, knocking was observed so this is a very good video though the uh, graphics are not that good but if you hear and we try to see it carefully then you will probably see this actually has happened they have cut and uh, joined a glass a high strength glass in order to uh, record the internals of a combustion engine i mean internal part they they place a camera over the glass and they re they physically recorded the things that were happening so you try and see this video though the graphics are poor but it will be very helpful to you in order to understand what actually happens and what is the problem in detonation pre ignition and uh, what do you say that no king so just try to see this video this is combustion of the fuel air mixture in a special gasoline engine it was photographed with a special camera operating at 40000 pictures per second which means that the action is here slowed down 2500 times you can perhaps better appreciate the meaning of 40000 pictures per second by seeing what it does to a photographer's flash bulb the bulb actually fires in a hundredth of a second and this firecracker it actually explodes in a thousandth of a second In order to photograph the combustion inside an engine, a special glass window was placed in the head of a cylinder. The camera will look through this window and see the burning of the fuel air mixture. With normal combustion, after the spark plug ignites the charge, the flame front spreads outward and across the combustion chamber. Now, in actual photography, at 40,000 pictures per second, This is how normal combustion appears. Throughout combustion, you can see a steady and controlled transformation of chemical energy into heat energy. The black spot at the upper right is caused by uneven lighting. It has no significance relative to the mixture of fuel and air. Notice the continual motion in the burning zone. Combustion can also be shown in the form of a graph. pressure is indicated vertically time horizontally that is the time required for those parts of the compression and power strokes shown here the pressure increases as the piston rises on the compression stroke when the spark ignites the mixture the pressure increases very rapidly as the piston is pushed down on the power stroke the pressure decreases This record of normal combustion shows smooth even development of full power. Now let's look at knocking combustion. The result of using fuel of insufficient anti-knock value. The flame front will start as in normal combustion. But near the end zone, it will appear to hesitate. And then the unburned portion of the mixture will detonate or explode. This is knock. as seen in animated drawings now let's see it at 40000 pictures per second watch for the slight hesitation of the flame front just before knock and note how the knock sets up violent vibrations did you understand what is the problem there should be a uniform combustion it should not be that blast should happen we always use terms blast and explosion but actually that is, that is you uh, uh, wrong so a uniform combustion should happen as you saw that there was the combustion propagating from this side and it went to this side so that was normal but what happened in the knocking was 
the combustion was propagating from this side and it was going and at the end when this section was having some unburnt fuel an explosion happened a, 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 a blast happened and that blast is known as knocking nothing but that blast see see it at 40000 pictures per second watch for the slight hesitation of the flame front just before a knock and note how the knock sets up violent vibrations it's happening right now this the speed of the knock is so fast that it is extremely difficult to measure knock is caused by pressures and temperatures that get too high for the anti-knock value of the fuel being used the unburned gases explode with terrific force On the graph, knocking combustion can be illustrated very clearly. Again, on the compression stroke, pressure increases. When the spark ignites the mixture, the pressure increases very rapidly. As the pressure reaches its peak, knock shows up as violent and rapid pressure changes. Compare this graph with the graph of normal combustion. Knock results in loss of power. It also causes overheating and excessive wear on the engine. Knocking with pre-ignition is another example of poor combustion. Pre-ignition is usually caused by a carbonaceous deposit that becomes incandescent in the engine cylinder. It's commonly called a hot spot. Pre-ignition by a hot spot produces the same kind of flame front as that caused by a badly over-advanced spark, causing combustion to get completely out of control. Knocking will occur if fuel of insufficient anti-knock value is used. Seen in slow motion photography, pre-ignition occurs before the spark plug fires. Knocking occurs after the spark plug fires. The pre-ignition effect of the hot spot is the same as that caused by an additional spark plug with its timing advanced too far. A good part of the heat energy prematurely released by pre-ignition. So did you did you notice the difference between the knocking and pre-ignition? In pre-ignition, there is an additional spark that is happening just because of a hot spot inside a cylinder. So that is causing, actually, the spark plug is firing from here and there was an additional spark that happened due to the sport, a hot spot, and it fired up inside the cylinder before the ignition could happen. So this is pre-ignition. Ignition may be wasted. Now let's look at the graph for this kind of combustion. Pre-ignition by the hot spot causes the pressure to rise rapidly and very early. Ignition by the spark increases the pressure further. Knocking again occurs when the temperatures and pressures get too high for the anti-knock value of the fuel being used. Compare this graph with the graph of normal combustion. Pre-ignition has the effect of advancing the timing to such a great extent that the peak pressure occurs before the piston has reached the top of the compression stroke. The loss of power is now very considerable. And again, there is overheating and excessive wear on the engine. Obviously, knock and pre-ignition should be prevented. Only normal combustion will produce a steady and controlled transformation of chemical energy into heat energy. Only regulated, even burning will provide full, smooth power. This kind of controlled combustion, assuring full power and protection against damage to the engine, is achieved with a fuel which is high enough in octane rating 
which also contains an anti-pre-ignition additive. Ethyl anti-knock compound is used by most refiners to increase the octane rating of their gasolines. So this should be understood. Now you try to hear it carefully and you will hear the sound of the engine is disturbed by some additional sound. Just hear it. As soon as this person starts saying stop, stop, that means uh, there was an additional noise that was coming Krrr, type of sound. Sorry, I produced that. Just try to. So this is the knocking sound that actually is produced by the engine because of the wrong firing order or because of the uh, the blast or the detonation that is happening inside. So if it is too large, that can be heard outside of the vehicle. That means it is uh, now the worst situation for your vehicle and you should get it uh, resolved. Now we have uh, one more topic left for today's discussion of the morning session. I want you to share your doubts if you have related to so far that we, we discussed now. Any doubts? Okay, then we'll continue. So what is cooling system and why the cooling system is required inside an internal combustion engine? And what will be the problems if there is no cooling system in a vehicle or in, a, in an engine? So the cooling system, first of all, let us understand what is the requirement of the cooling system. The cooling system is provided in the IC engines for the following reasons. First of all, the temperature of the burning gases in the engine cylinder reaches up to as much as 1500 to 2000 degrees Celsius, which is above the melting point of the material with which the uh, body of the engine and engine head are made. Only platinum a metal that has one of the highest melting points melts at 1750 degree and iron at 1530 degree and aluminum at 670, 657 or six, approximately 660 degrees. Therefore, if the heat is not dissipated, it would result into failure of the cylinder materials. Due to very high temperature, the film of lubricating oil will get oxidized and thus producing carbon deposits on the surface. This will result into the piston seizure. Then due to the overheating, large temperature difference may lead to distortion of the engine components due to the thermal stresses setup. For the engine temperature variation to be kept minimum and regulated. Higher temperature will also lower the volumetric efficiency of the engine. Now, cooling of the efficient requirements of the cooling efficient cooling system. So these were the requirements of cooling system. Now we will understand the requirements of an efficient cooling system. So it should not be like we want to make this uh, freezing at zero minus de some degree Celsius. No, there is limited amount amount of heat that we need to, so that our system get, get gets us the best performance that it can. So efficient cooling system system should have two requirements. First of all, it should not be capable of removing all the heat. It should only remove up to about 30 percent of the heat generated inside the combustion chamber. Too much remo removal of heat will lower down the thermal efficiency of the engine. And moreover, it is not uh, pretty possible for us to remove the uh, not possible. Actually, it is not practical. It is not uh, obvious for us to remove remove the entire heat that right? as, as we will need to design a lot of systems to uh, flush out that heat, which is not basically useful also. 
so we just need to remove only 30% up to 30% of the heat and that let, let rest of it let it be inside so it should remove the heat at fast rate when the engine is hot during the starting of the engine the cooling system should be slow so that the different working parts reach their operating temperatures in a short time so uh, when you start your vehicle when you start your car you must have noticed that right away as you start your car a perfectly working car will not start the radiator fan the cooling system starts after 5 or 10 minutes of running the engine right so the types of cooling system we have four major type two major types of cooling system uh air cooling system and water cooling system so what is air cooling system and what is water cooling system we will understand it first of all let us understand the air cooling system the air cooling system is designed in such a way that the surface area of the head engine head engine globe and the parts on which the heat is excessively present we increase the surface area and we let the maximum air strike onto that surface so that automatically or naturally the heat can be flushed away or it can be cooled down by the heat of the flowing air itself so in this type of cooling system the heat which is conducted at to the outer parts of the engine is radiator radiated and taken away by the stream of air which is obtained from the atmosphere now in order to have the efficient cooling by means of air provides the fins around this cylinder and cylinder head that increases the contact area or the surface area which the air will be striking it the fins are metallic ridges that which are formed uh, during the casting of the cylinder and cylinder head the amount of heat carried by uh, these cooling depends on the following factors the total area of the fin surfaces the velocity and amount of the cooling air and the temperature of the fins and uh, the of the cooling air so basically there are two temperatures one the air is, is having a temperature and one the, the engine is having a temperature so these temperatures and the amount of uh, air that is striking onto the engine and its velocity and basically the fin surface area so these are three factors which will uh, decide the cooling um, cooling efficiency of a system or a air cooled system so air cooling is mostly uh, tractors mostly of the tractors of less horsepower motorcycles scooters small cars and small aircraft engines where the forward motion of the machine gives good velocity to cool the engine air cooling is also provided in some small industrial engines in this system individual cylinders are generally employed to provide ample cooling area by providing fins a uh, blower is used to provide air sometimes so you will see that the size of air cooled engine is not that big it is always kept small as possible because uh, the big size engines will be having uh, greater heat and they will need some cooling system liquid cooling system or oil cooling system to be uh, placed in order so that the cooling is effective and efficient now the advantages of air cooling engines air cooled engines are air cooled engine have the following advantages first the design of air cooled engine is simple it is lighter in weight than water cooled engine due to the absence of water jackets radiators circulating pumps and weight of the cooling water then it is cheaper to manufacture it needs less care and maintenance and the system of cooling is particularly advantageous where there are extreme climatic conditions and in the arctic or where there is scarcity of water in the desert so no risk of damage from the frost and of the cracking of the cylinder jackets and radiators or the water tubes so these are the air cooling systems and if you see these lines these these lines or these surfaces these are the ridges or the uh, fins and these are designed in a special manner to maximize the contact area on which the air will strike so this is this part of the engine is having maximum heat this is the engine head block and uh, under this will be uh, this uh, the cylinder so this when air strikes onto these fins this is the maximum possible surface area for this particular part 
so it will cool down easily and rapidly then we have the liquid cooling system uh, or the water cooling system the water cooling system it serves two purposes in working of an engine it takes away the excessive heat generated in the engine and saves it from overheating it keeps the engine at working temperature and efficient for the economical working the cooling system has four types direct or non redundant system thermo siphon system hopper system pump or forced circulation system so basically non redundant water cooling system means they pump engines or the engines that uh, that are used for light applications and they are fixed at a place so they use this type of cooling system and this is very old technology and it is used where there is no problem of water i mean water is abundantly available so it is not any scarcity so this is suitable for large installations where the plenty of water is available and the system are not movable so frequently so the water from a storage tank is directly supplied to the engine cylinder and the hot water is not cooled for reuse but it simply discharges so the low low hp engine coupled with the irrigation pump is an example so then then there is a thermo siphon a water cooling system this system works on the principle that hot water being lighter rises up and the cold water being heavier goes down in this system the radiator is placed at a higher level than the engine for the easy and low water towards the engine again the same thing that these are very low efficiency engines low hp engines and they do not usually move themselves so heat uh, is conducted to the water jackets from the from where it is taken away due to the con convection by circulating water as the water jacket becomes hot it rises due to the uh, is rise, it rises to the top of the radiator the cold water from the radiator takes place uh, of the rising hot water in this way a circulation happens and cooling is happening so this helps uh, in the keeping engine at working temperature so again the same thing like very uh, limited number of applications that can use this particular system then we have the hopper water cooling system this also works on the same principle as the thermo siphon system in this there is a hopper on the jacket containing water which surrounds the engine cylinder in this system as soon as the water starts boiling it replaced by the cold water an engine fitted with the this system cannot return for several hours without being refilled with water and you will see that the these three so far with that that we have discussed are very inefficient and uh, cannot be used in automotive applications now there is third fourth part that forced uh, circulation water cooling system this is what we use in the uh, automotive applications or with the internal combustion engines in the automobiles this system is similar to the construction of thermo siphon system except that it makes use of a centrifugal pump to circulate and in part number the second number uh, cooling system that thermo uh, siphon system it was using gravity to take i mean it was using the principle of hot water and cold water uh, being lighter and heavier uh, and this time we are using a centrifugal pump to circulate the water throughout the water jackets and the radiator the water flows from the lower portion of the radiator to the water jackets and through the centrifugal pump after circulation water comes back to the radiator and it loses heat by the pro process of radiation this system is employed in cars trucks radiators its tractors etc so uh, i have a video for this also and this is very informative video just see we will understand function working principle construction and working of this uh, system so function basically when engine works so the due to the sparks and due to the com combustion inside the chamber the temperature goes up and it becomes high but we need the temperature to be in the normal range so we want some cooling system in action so the principle is that hot water and cold water when these two bodies then these two systems have difference in temperature and if we join them there will be heat transfer until 
the temperature of both the systems is same so heat will flow from hot hot uh, system to the cold system this is heat transfer always it will happen this is the principle that we are going to use now construction we will see that this is engine and from the engine it, this uh, the cooling line or the cool what this liquid is going to the thermostat which will decide the operating temperature at which it is supposed to be sent to the radiator or directly to the engine so one one of the line is connected to the upper tank of the radiator and from the radiator it is the centrifugal pump and from the pump it is the engine so now there is one more line that bypasses the uh, radiator and it goes directly to the engine i'll tell you why it is done so then from the pressure release cap there is a reservoir attached so that if any overflow happens in the upper tank of the radiator it goes to the reservoir and from the reservoir to the feed line now see the working what happens when the engine starts running in the first run of like 5 minutes to 10 minutes the engine will not be having any remarkable temperature or any heat to be removed so at that moment the thermostat will sense that this is not the temperature that it the liquid should be cooled or the water should be cooled so it bypasses this line it closes this line and it sends this cooling system directly to the engine and slowly when the temperature of the engine it rises up inside the thermostat there is a rubber seal and a wax so the wax melts up and it closes this particular section it brings it down and it closes this section the bypass section and it allows this section to open up so that the few uh, the uh, working fluid or the liquid can now go to the radiator it is hot now after it is coming into this upper tank of the radiator it is now the uh, job of the radiator to cool it down so you will see that these are the fins specially designed fins over here and there is a fan with the radiator so the hot uh, liquid it travels down in the fins and there is air blowing over this radiator so the radiation happens and uh, due to this the heat of the cooling system, the this coolant is taken away by these fins and the cold water is stored inside inside the lower tank and from this lower tank it goes to the centrifugal pump there and from the pump it goes into the engine section and this is how your cooling action is completed now it will go on and there there will be instances when the uh, system again senses that the engine is not having particular load engine is not under high heavy performance so there will be instances that when the engine is at mbd like a required temperature it will stop working and when this there is this thermostat senses that the uh, cooling system should be activated so it will again start operating then what happens what is the uh, this role of the reservoir you will see that this is a pressure release valve over here and a line is connected a pipe is connected from this valve to this uh, reservoir so when excessive temperature rises up so it will take away this liquid uh, from here and it will fill up the reservoir and from the reservoir it can also go into this line and with mix with this cold uh, the cool liquid over here and it will go directly to the engine so this is the liquid cooling system then uh, this will be all for this session then for the evening session we are left with the the lubrication and types of lubrication clutches types of clutches and transmission and differential so we have an important discussion to be done uh, in the evening then i'll be giving you some questions for tomorrow and in cooling system we just are left with the explanation of some components that we can do in the evening session like what whatever the components i just showed in the animation these are the same components we'll see if you have some doubts uh, you can ask me now or we can close this session
Am I audible? Yes, sir. I think so someone asked. If, doubt. if there are no doubts, uh, we can just close this session. Someone Johan Joseph asked about how is firing order affected in a V arrangement? Sorry, how is firing order affected in a V arrangement? V arrangement. See, Do okay, we uh, we we type of engine when we discuss the V engine, the principle of operation of firing order is same in every uh, every case of engine. Like uh, uh, suppose you have a V type of arrangement. So then this will be a different meaning of calculation. So it depends on three principles, right? So this principle includes your uh, vib vibrations and heat and the back pressure. So that that time we need to have what is the best arrangement like we saw uh, in this inline engine when we saw. I'll share my screen for a moment. In inline engine, when we saw that this and this piston, these are two pistons. And if we fire this first and then this first or this then and this then. So what will be the so the first fire was happened in this cylinder. OK, so due to this fire, since this. Crankshaft is having bearing support. And in V also there will be the V support. OK, so when we fire this engine, this this cylinder, there will be load on this bearing also. And due to this load, there will be load on these this bearing also. Obviously, because this distance is less and this uh, the combustion is happening on on here only. So this this load over here or this force over here at this point will be greater than this point. OK. So now at the same time, if we fire up this particular cylinder, so that means the load on this that, that was already uh, greater will be added because this again is the load on this point will be greater than load on this point. So this total load on this point will be huge at the same time. So what we will do, it will not fire at this first. We will fire this or this. So it's always better if we fire this cylinder because of the obvious reasons. So when this fire happened and after that this happened, so the load on this, if we eliminate this particular cylinder for this point of time, so the load on this cylinder, this uh, because of the fire in this cylinder, the load on this point will be more. So this will be balanced. Then this may be and then this may be. So this is the inline configuration. If we have the V configuration, Let's say V or H, whatever the configuration we have, we will need to understand how or, or how many cylinders are connected. And by firing up of these cylinders, the load on the bearing of the crankshaft, how is it affecting? So we will need to see that though we have already established firing orders for every type of engine. So this is what we need to see. First of all, vibration. And then heat. And then back pressure. Based upon these three parameters, we will decide the firing order of any cylinder or of any type of cylinder. Is, uh, the next question from Rahul Matthew. OK, why water is not used nowadays? Why water is not in? Not used nowadays. I'll just read it out. Is it possible to read read it? Because I'm yes. not having I'm not getting the question. Uh, you can open the chat box. It's not visible to me. If you scroll up, uh, I think. I'm at the port. OK, you spell out the last part. What are you saying? The water is not used in? 
why water is not used nowadays nowadays okay no that is uh, not completely true water is never used water is used with the coolant in automotive applications you will see that water is used with the coolant so it is the light applications or it is just uh, we people that water we are not using so if you use in lighter applications the water if you use that is that will work for you so in in the automotive applications water alone cannot be working water cannot at all work so water has a limitation like it, it will boil at 100 degrees celsius right so it needs to mix with uh, some coolant and coolants are specially there so if you see uh, the irrigation pumps and if you see the industrial engines or if you see old jeeps you will see that only water was sufficient because the engine size and engine bhp was limited but you see the nowadays we want efficiency and we want comfort and we want performance so if you if we use water for example the efficiency of the cooling system will not be good we can use you can replace entire water from your radiator and you can fill it with water entire coolant from the radiator you can fill it with water you will see that resultant temperature of the engine at that moment is like if this is the range and this is the normal range this is the overheating range and this is the c range this is normal range and this is overheating range you will see that engine is still in normal area normal range but it is somewhat at greater temperature it is not the uh, you know uh, the acceptable temperature it is somewhat greater temperature and if it stays longer for at this temperature it is definitely going to have some issues and in old engines you might have seen or you might have observed that uh, there is a problem of uh, uh, blow or had had gasket leakage and that is once if the engine is overheated and if the gas uh, gasket the head gasket is broken or failed and if you open the block of an engine that means uh, the engine will now probably not be fixed as it was in previously condition previous condition so it will be fixed though but yes there the working temperature of the engine will not be normal it will be uh, inside normal it will be maximum so water is never used in the automotive ap applications it was always it was always coolant so it it was sometimes coolant with water and it was sometimes coolant alone water was never recommended so they were the uh, irrigation pumps and small pump en uh, pump engines and industrial pump industrial engines that were using the water because they do, do not need to have that much of efficiency in terms of performance or in terms of uh, comfort or in, in terms of the uh, mileage so we need to have a lot of things any other questions so the next question from charlie chako could you please explain back pressure okay back pressure all right this is the cylinder combustion chamber this is exhaust this is intake okay so what happens due to uh, the improper timing or due to also due to the bad design of exhaust manifold or bad placement of the exhaust manifold or abrupt uh, change of direction of the exhaust pipes and or direction or diameter so basically there are few things i will list them down bad ignition timing sudden change of diameter
डायमीटर ऑफ एग्जोस्ट पाइप डायमीटर चेंज मीन्स रिडक्शन देन चेंज ऑफ डायरेक्शन और यू कैन से बैंड इन दी एग्जोस्ट पाइप these are few things which will lead into the exhaust trapped inside here so it will not completely pass outside so what will happen this exhaust will try to come inside due to the pressure over here this exhaust will come inside or this exhaust will not try to go out so what will happen there will be some amount of exhaust emission or the gases that were burned are now inside the combustion chamber which are going to affect the fresh charge that is going that is coming in the next cycle so this disturbs us uh, in terms of cycle in terms of the resultant temperature of the uh, combustion chamber and it is going to affect the whole cycle so this is pressure which was supposed to go out through the exhaust manifold and through the muffler and through the catalytic converter and out in the environment it is now trapped due to the these parameters it is now trapped inside and it is trying to come inside the combustion chamber and this is why there is a pressure we know that back pressure the exhaust is trying to come instead of going out this is back pressure So the Any next more question? Uh, answer we are difference between turbo charged engine and super charged engine. Okay, there are there are two devices. Basically, first of all, let us understand what is turbo or what is super charge. So these are the power boosters. Okay, what is a power booster? Let's say this is your engine. It has a limited power supply. so if we can couple any other device with it so that it's additional it is getting additional power from here in the engine and the vehicle is now having larger speed larger power and larger torque okay so there are two devices known as turbo and super charger so basically the turbo charger takes i mean there are, there are the turbines inside this turbo charger device and we take the intake uh, we take the exhaust of uh, the uh, exhaust of the vehicle to drive this turbine and this will give additional power to the engine and the, the resultant power of the engine is now uh, more and then we have the supercharger so in this case we were taking the energy to run the turbocharger from the exhaust which was waste for us so we take we took the energy to run the or we took the power to run the turbocharger from the exhaust which was waste now in supercharger we attached a different mechanism that that will take the power from engine and it will run the super supercharger and the overall efficiency or overall uh, power or overall fuel economy of the engine is improved now so these are the turbo chargers and super chargers though it is going to take if if we go into detail in depth discussion so it is it is uh, it is going to take hours of discussion to discuss the turbo charger and super charger the in construction and uh, the exact components working and all so the principle of operation is what i told you that it works on the exhaust energy and this supercharger works on the energy of the engine which uh, is coupled by the belt or by the gear mechanism next question uh, next from joel joby why we use starter motor in engines why can't we just fire the cylinders directly instead of using starter motor okay for for you uh, my question is how alternatively would you fire this engine i mean okay let us say this is the cylinder let us say this is your cylinder okay now over here is your spark plug 
right tell me or no do not tell me just think how is it possible for you to fire it up even if you can produce a spark inside if there is no fuel how is it going to make a combustion first of all so this starter which you are talking about is not only uh, to help you to uh, uh, make the spark over here but also to move the piston because this piston needs to go down right in order to go down then if when it is going down there will be a partial vacuum inside and then only there will be the space for the fuel to come in and when the fuel is coming in and the starter motor see first cycle of the operation is operated by the starter right when you switch on the ignition when you just turn the key so basically you do not directly spark it the spark plug you basically move the piston so you will happen to see that if you just put the car in gear or the bike in gear and you switch on the ignition switch you will see that the vehicle is trying to move forward so that is happening just because you are rotating the crank shaft by rotating this uh, turning this key to ignition switch you are commanding the starter motor that you turn the crank shaft now crank shaft turning means you push the piston up or down so when you when the piston is coming down a fresh charge or the fuel air mixture or the fuel is coming inside then when the piston is going upward this fuel is being compressed and when the time is right when the compression is maximum then this will be the uh, command sent to the uh, uh, this uh, uh, spark plug that generate the spark now so this is not to generate a spark but to complete the cycle so once this cycle is completed that that is no no more needed because this engine is now self running now you will see uh, a self a self starter motor or uh, anything this the construction looks like this i'll try to draw a section view for you this is a starter motor coupled with the flywheel so now here you have a gear which appears only till the duration you turn on the ignition switch so there are some gears inside it and there are some magnetos inside it so as soon as you turn on this ignition switch the circuit gets complete and this gear comes out this gear pops up basically you can physically see it coming out uh, if if you have the section view okay so at that time what will happen this is the flywheel and over the flywheel we have a ring which has teeth over it so for the duration for which you have turned on the key this gear will come out and this will mash with this gear over the flywheel there is a flywheel and over the flywheel we have a ring gear so this will mash with that gear and this flywheel is directly connected to your crank shaft and crank shaft is di directly connected to your connecting rod and the connecting rod is directly connected to the piston and piston is inside the cylinder and when when you turn on the key you are basically rotating this gear and this gear is rotating this particular gear and this gear is rotating this crank shaft this crank shaft is reciprocating the piston upward or downward so in order to start the engine you are providing it additional energy or additional power so that the piston can compress the initial stage of the fluid and oh, fuel once the fuel is compressed the uh, the ignition system will command the spark plug that generate the spark now and the combustion will happen once the combustion happened and you turned the you you left the switch the switch will go back into its position on where this gear is no more in contact with this gear like the uh, driving gear of the starter motor is not in contact with the ring gear of the uh, flywheel so it will go back inside and if you happen to see that uh, when you when your engine is started and still you have turned on the key you will hear some sound right you might have heard that so that sound is of mashing of this gear the starter gear with the ring gear of this so this is not necessary to generate a spark but to generate a cycle which will run the engine for the rest of the time i hope this should be clear now
Do we have any more doubts? Uh -huh. Yes, sir. From Jaswin Thomas. CC and number of cylinders of vehicle. How it's related? What what? CC and okay. number of cylinders of vehicle. How it's related? OK, I told you the uh, capacity of one cylinder. Let's say this is the CC. So when you hear when you hear that this is 110 CC engine, this is 800 CC engine and this is 1200 or 1600 CC engine. So it is basically the CC is basically resultant of all the cylinders that an engine has. So if it is a single cylinder engine, it is this volume of inside uh, the cylinder of only one cylinder, right? And if we multiply all the cylinders with this particular volume, so this will give you the resultant CC of the engine. So when you hear that 110 CC is like your bike is 110 CC, that is capacity of the engine is 110 CC. And if if you see that the uh, there are three cylinders and the overall CC capacity of the engine is 800, that means 800 will be divided by three and that will be the capacity of individual cylinder. So the overall capacity of the engine or cubic capacity of the engine is to be divided by number of cylinder. This is how it is related. Next. Uh, from answer we are, how does hybrid engine work? Okay, how does hybrid engine work? Hybrid and hybrid means we have two powers. So it could be electrical power and it could be combustion power. So there is one engine and one motor. Okay, so we had the engine output over here. And we have another output of the motor which is connected to the engine output. This output is then connected to the transmission. And this is now transmission is going now to tires. So how these are coupled is a complex question. We need to design a, a unit or a power transmission unit to couple these two engines like there are two engines one is motor maybe and one is engine maybe so other than in motor there could be nothing else so hybrid is the electric vehicle and the combustion vehicle coupled together so suppose there is a motor over here and there is an engine over here this is one output of the motor this is one output of the engine and the complex question is how do we couple them so it is like we couple them with the help of a compound shaft which is driven by both of these this motor also and this engine also and from this compound shaft we have the tra transmission unit attached 